<laughs> okay. So when you look at the question of uh, psychoanalysis and history from two different, at least two different points of view, one is how we can use psychoanalysis to understand history, and the second is how we can use history to understand psychoanalysis. And uh, the two people we're going to uh, listen to today have made contributions to both of these ways of uh, understanding things. Uh, Robert Lifton is in many ways the founder of uh, psychohistory's most famous book probably is uh, The Nazi Doctors. And Daniel Pick uh, has, uh, in pursuit of the Nazi mind, his most uh, recent book, uh, but also in so many ways the, the, the mind behind the uh, London conference, and I, I gathered this one as well. So with that, I'll... Uh, well, thank you very much. Well, it's a great privilege to um, be here to talk to Robert J. Lifton. Do I need a microphone? Where is yes. the microphone? It's right here. Isn't it? Okay. So it's a great privilege to be uh, having this conversation with Robert J. Lifton. And I think he, in, in many ways, as Eli says, in a way, um, it was very famous. He doesn't need introduction. People will know many of his works. Um, and I guess I first came across him through the Nazi doctors back in the early 1980s as a, as a student. But it was more recently, really, with my interest in um, the, the history of psychohistory and the question of why America developed this genre and Britain, Britain didn't in the post-war period that I, he came back to my attention. And then more recently with my interest in the 1950s and the Cold War and brainwashing, which I was talking about yesterday, led me also back to his early work. So we thought we'd have a conversation for the next sort of 30, 35 minutes, the two of us, and then open it up to discussion. Um, and what, what I also realized from the last two days of the conference is many of the names that people have, have been uh, referring to, from Eric Erickson to Norman Mailer, from Ronnie Lang to Robert Stoller, are all people that Robert knew and has um, you know, reminiscences about. So that there are many ways this conversation could go. But I wanted to start, Robert, just by asking you perhaps just to describe the people your route to psychoanalysis in the first place. Well, at the time that I came into intellectual consciousness um, right in the immediate post-war era, psychoanalysis was the path for every ambitious and presumably intellectual psychiatrist. So an interest in psychiatry at that time led readily towards psychoanalysis. Uh, in a way, psychoanalysis had oversold itself in American society. Uh, it had emerged from, I think, World War II with considerable brilliance because there weren't many or any other psychologies that did much for soldiers when they had combat difficulties uh, in comparison with psychoanalysis. But inevitably, psychoanalysis came to its own dogmas uh, and had lots of difficulties. However, there was a wave of psychoanalytic triumph and triumphalism, uh, which certainly uh, influenced young people like myself in that direction. Right. Um, we'll come back to the dogmas uh, shortly, I think, uh, which uh, something I wanted to ask you about. But I should have actually just said by way of introduction, I mean, not only can people obviously know about the history of Robert's work through his, book, his many books, but also witness to an extreme century, a memoir, um, which, which has been published, and uh, so uh, in a way that's the background to my conversation, but I know pe many people here will be interested in that. Um, but I wanted to go actually back before you became a psychoanalytic candidate um, to, uh, to, to just the period uh, uh, of the beginning of the Korean War, and because that was before you became an analytic candidate right. later in the 50s, but just to ask you how you ended up as a psychiatrist in the Air Force. Yes, uh... I ended up as a psychiatrist in the Air Force because I was drafted and went kicking and screaming uh, into military service. At that time, there was a doctor draft in this country, and uh, they put it to me straight. Uh, either you uh, seek uh, a commission as a medical officer in one of the services, or we draft you as a private. Well, you know which one I chose. Uh, however, I later became more critical of my own decision because uh, thinking historically, the Korean War, which was so accepted in American life as necessary to, quote, stop communism, 
turned out to be a very dubious military venture on the scale with which it was initiated uh, at that time. But uh, so I spent two years in the Far East uh, and uh, most of the time in Japan, but six months in Korea, and that gave me some beginning sense of war peace issues, although I wasn't really asked to uh, treat people in combat. They reserved that for regular officers, not for reservists like me, who they thought were too soft uh, and were likely to show uh, empathy, if not uh, sympathy as well, for people who were hurting and to send them back to the United States. Uh, whereas the role of physicians in the military is to keep command strong, for the most part, and they're likely to have a conflict with the Hippocratic Oath on that score. But anyhow, that's how I got right. to into the military and my initial interests. So you've gone from medicine in New York to being uh, a psychiatrist in the Air Force to Korea, and then in 1953, uh, you found yourself given, I think it was your last mission uh, as, as part of this uh, uh, period. Uh, I'd like you to just describe for people what, how that got you interested in thought reform. The, um, my last military assignment, well, I, I heard about returning POWs, returning uh, to uh, the border area of North and South Korea from uh, being uh, prisoners of war, mostly in Chinese or North Korean hands. And uh, uh, I heard that they were being interviewed and people were confused by them because some had expressed communist images or beliefs. Uh, all of them were confused and I could arrange to be transferred to uh, Korea. I'd been in Korea for six months, back in Japan, to be transferred back to Korea to join in that process with military psychiatrists. And that consisted of interviewing people individually and then returning to the United States on a troop ship called the General Pope, in my case, in which I did more and others, more interviews and group sessions with returning POWs. And what I experienced then was that this was a really interesting and uh, kind of unknown process. There had been a lot of hysteria about it uh, in various ways, even with the term, quotes, brainwashing, a dubious term, but you can't get rid of it. It's here to stay with us. Uh, and, uh, and it was really interesting to look into it, to interview people, to find out what was at issue. But that wasn't so easy to do in a military setting where one is concerned, one can only have a certain amount of time, and one is worried that if one writes certain things uh, on a report, it could uh, hurt the individual person who's being interviewed. And from there, I was later able to do a more systematic and thorough study in Hong Kong of um, two types of people. One were Westerners, Europeans and Americans, who had been imprisoned and accused of being spies by the Chinese communists, and of Chinese intellectuals and students who were put through a systematic so-called thought reform program uh, that I studied and later wrote about. Before we, uh, before we leave the General Pope, I think it would just be good just to sort of give a bit the flavor of what some of those interviews were like, because I know the POWs were often divided into, had been divided into groups yes. by their captors, but then there were, there were great tensions often within the the groups on the ship, and you had to deal with both groups. It was it was a painful time for those returning POWs, soldiers. Um, they were deeply confused. There had been uh, these hysterical reports of how they'd all been converted to Chinese communism, how they'd been weak because of the weakness in American society. Well, there are plenty of weaknesses in American society but that wasn't the reason for their behavior. It really had to do with their confusion in that situation as to what they believed. Um, they would use terms like, I put my mind in neutral. Uh, and that, of course, relates to, sometimes it can be called apathy or relates to psychoanalytic defense mechanisms uh, such as repression or, or uh, uh, derealization. But I came to, then and later in my work, a term psychic numbing, meaning the diminished capacity or inclination to feel, because it's a defense mechanism that deals specifically with feeling and non-feeling. 
it had that virtue. In any case, that's the way they appeared. And even when the boat docked in San Francisco, it was interesting and sad to watch them because uh, they they had no real joy. They they looked sort of numbly uh, uh, and. It was a wise thing to have the trip, the 15-day voyage, I, I believe it was, because at least there was that interlude between their release and uh, their return home. Return home, of course, as you might imagine, was far from easy for them. But I didn't feel I had really learned enough about that uh, process under those military conditions. And the fact that you went on being so interested in that process and then went on in Hong Kong to extend the project. I, mean, I wondered how much that was sort of backshadowed by the Second World War, by fascism, by the Moscow show trials of the 30s, as well as the immediate experience of the Korean War. So perhaps you could just say something about your fam- what led you to be so fascinated by this problem. Looking back historically at that time, um, and you know, in terms of discussion before, it isn't so much a question of whether something is historical or not. Everything is historical. The question is whether we can have a historical perspective about it. But in that early post-war era, uh, you know, it was a a time, what I later came to write about more recently, the superpower syndrome. America was all-powerful, and that's a very dangerous position. All-powerful militarily, economically, and in some degree morally, more than it deserved uh, at that time. Uh, But it had the advantage for young Americans like me of being thrust out into the world and we had a sense we could do anything in the way of research. There was a lot of research money available and that means a lot because if you can get money you can do the kind of work you want to do. Uh, And there was that sense of American strength which I have to confess those of us who were extremely critical of American politics and much of American behavior nonetheless shared, myself included. So um, the way that I got to Hong Kong is that my wife and I, I decided to be discharged from the military in Japan so that we could take a world, uh, around the world trip on our way back to the United States uh, before I was to uh, uh, give in to the necessity of psychoanalytic training <laughs> and, and a, a career in psychiatry and psychoanalysis. And it turned out that Hong Kong was only our second stop. And um, I was introduced to people coming out of China who were fascinating to see. Some of them were missionaries, Western missionaries, some were Chinese intellectuals. They had been through a profound process. You know, I've told Daniel there there are two illusions or mythic illusions about thought reform. One is that it's all powerful and can't be resisted and it's almost a supernatural form of mind control. Not so at all. It can be understood in natural, (coughs) naturalistic terms. The other myth is that it doesn't exist and it's just a little bit of persuasion, a little more persuasion here than there. Actually, it has been a systematic program uh, confession, con- con- criticism, self-criticism, uh, and with a certain amount of psychological know-how, though not necessarily derived from psychological sources, so that the Chinese program for Chinese would always end <coughs> with enormously intense denunciation of the father as a symbol of the old regime and the evil past. So in a way, the work you then did in Hong Kong reinforced or gave a much stronger sense of, if not brainwashing, of thought reform, even compared with what you discovered with the POWs. I mean, there was something more extreme about what some of these, these individuals had been through. Absolutely. I could begin to understand things from that. There were two aspects to thought reform. One was the confession extraction. To some extent, the world was familiar with that through the Soviets and their notorious uh, uh, trials of the 30s and, and wartime. Uh, But the second part of it, the systematic re-education, as it was called, was primarily a Chinese contribution. And one of the ironies of that was, as I was to discover, was that um, they denounced in thought reform the Confucian past as reactionary, but much of the process was derived from the cultural influence of Confucianism, which held that one should criticize and oneself uh, be prone to criticism and self-criticism and had a 
a principle called the rectification of names, which meant that if one didn't live up to what was supposed to be the name or responsibility one had in society, one had to change and be changed, even with the help of one's disciples. So it, it, it embraced a Confucian element while denouncing and it, uh, Confucianism, and it was considerably a Chinese uh, contribution. And it, it culminates then with a book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism in 1961, but um, in which you also set out famously these eight criteria, which perhaps we won't go over, but many people will know of sort of sacred science and milieu control and the triumph of well, dogma over... The, the over. point of that was, for me, to, to universalize the findings. Okay, the Chinese had developed all this, but they weren't the only people to mm. use uh, various totalistic ideologies and create that kind of environment. They did it more systematically than anyone else. They weren't the only people capable of it. And that was, of course, confirmed by our own CIA, uh, because the CIA was eager to get a piece of it. They wanted to do mind control because they figured that was some arcane achievement of the evil enemy. And uh, since the evil enemy was our antagonist in the world, we better have some of it ourselves. And then they embarked upon it. And that had to do with studies of uh, various drugs like LSD, but also pressures of mind control, which they always did very crudely. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was the Soviet contribution, which uh, had to do with, um, with czarist police, even before the Soviets and their confession extraction. And, uh, and you got elements of what had to be, I think, generalized around totalistic, all or none, ideological systems. And they had some of these characteristics of, that I tried to name, eight deadly sins, I call them. One of them was milieu control, you attempt to control all the communication in the environment. Sacred science, you want both a religious fervor and a claim of scientific truth for your dogma. Um, and, and perhaps the most um, dangerous aspect of these eight deadly sins was what I, uh, uh, what I came to call um, uh, the, the, the right to exist in other words, the dispensing of existence, the dispensing of existence. In other words, if you are a totalistic ideological system, you believe you have an ultimate truth, and therefore any methods you use are justified because it's for a higher purpose. So people uh, who didn't share this ideology had no right to exist, and that could be relatively benign, in which they simply wouldn't be given good opportunities in the society, or it could be much more malign malignant, where they would be put to death for the wrong ideas, uh, uh, or, or what Camus later called crimes of reason. Right. Crimes of reason. And as an, Amer an American liberal in that period, it, clearly you were wanting to differentiate the work you were doing from the kind of more shrill and hysterical and we've heard a lot in this conference about J. Edgar Hoover and uh, the whole McCarthyism, but, and you were unhappy with the word brainwashing, but you, and you also wanted, in a way, to see what these ideas could say about post-war America and then also about the psychoanalytic community. Absolutely, and uh, I was always, uh, in some degree, active or activist, in, in, or tried to be in political ways, and tried and, and wrote about the effort to combine scholarship and activism uh, in the ancient uh, academic, some of it Germanic academic tradition. There's the idea that these two can never meet and that one is the enemy of the other. I think uh, if they're done carefully and rigorously, they help each other because um, activism can give significance to one's scholarship uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, Schol scholarship can give wisdom to activism. In any case, my background politically was sort of social democratic. My parents were Rooseveltian Democrats and came from this New York area where my father went to the City College of New York, which was always a progressive source. Uh, and that's what I began with. And so I hated communist thought reform because of its... Um, pressures on the human mind and uh, uh, a, a kind of allergy to totalism of any kind that I developed. On the other hand, I didn't want to become 
a phenomenon of the anti-communist intellectual, which was an American way to earn a living. Uh, and, you know... Uh, you were even offered, I think, uh, the chance to work for American intelligence, which you oh, politely I, declined, I think. I had my offers, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I had a phone call once, uh, I guess in the 60s, uh, and it was a very straight-laced character at the other end of the phone, and he said, well, Dr. Lifton, let me congratulate you on your book. I said, thank you, and he said... Um, uh, it's a wonderful book, and you know, um, we take prisoners at times, and we'd love for you to consult with us. <laughs> and I was stunned by this. I don't know quite what to say, so I decided to respond as an academic snob. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, well, then you haven't read my book carefully. <laughs> because in my book, I said that we want to identify thought reform or thought reform-like tendencies and avoid them not really fall into them or embrace them. Well, that was pretty much the end of our conversation. <laughs> Let's, temp tempting that it is to go on with that, I wanted to just go now to, in a way, your entry into the psychoanalytic world and the Boston Psychoanalytic Society. So what, what was your sense of, of what that world was like when you first entered into it? Um, as I was, uh, as I had my residency training here in New York and uh, it was then dominated by psychoanalytic thought and our most interesting teachers were psychoanalysts. Uh, but I also noticed a hardening of psychoanalytic dogma. And uh, I was interested in history very early, even in uh, secondary school and university. I, uh, history was a, a, a major concern of mine. And when I read the early psychoanalytic literature about history, I could see that when looked at dogmatically, uh, one could uh, reduce history into psychopathology or into clinical terms, uh, whether it's oral, anal cultures, or uh, classical psychoanalysis, in my evolving judgment, didn't do too well with history. Uh, I was influenced enormously by Eric Erickson, who... Uh, who really got when, when did you first meet him? I met him in 1956, soon after I came back with my work on thought reform, but before mm -hmm. I published my first book. And it was interesting in that uh, I was humble and awed by him because I, I had read him and admired what he was doing. Uh, and he was enormously interested in me, not in me personally, but Chinese thought reform had reverberations for him in terms of what he was interested in. <coughs> And, you know, uh, mentors can be interested in followers quite a lot, especially when they bring certain kinds of work that feed their own imagination. And he was about to go off to write Young Man Luther, and he could immediately make associations between uh, Chinese intellectuals being pressured in the thought reform process and Luther being trained for the church in another totalistic process. And we went back and forth with Chinese thought reform and Luther and walked around Stockbridge for about eight times, as I said, that first time I met him. Uh, the other thing I remember about that first meeting was that he said, well, we, your preens, he said, believe that the best ideas are had in walking. And I always thought the best ideas were had when you sat quietly at your desk alone. But I was willing to uh, agree with him. So, so we walked and walked around Stockbridge and actually became very good friends over you know, 30 or 40 years until he died. But that was the first encounter with him. And Freud, although you had your doubts about the reduction of history to psychology in the worst cases of, of that kind of Freud, you thought nonetheless Freud had inspired you as well as Erickson from quite a, an early stage, I think. Freud had been uh, a central figure in my life. I read him av avidly, and he was a, a, a kind of hero, a heroic figure. I know all sorts of new materials come out that puncture his heroism. That's fine. Uh, uh, he, he was a human being with frailties, but nonetheless a heroic one. Uh, but uh, in ways that I just mentioned, I thought that the hardening of psychoanalytic dogma, at least in relation, or at least the early expressions toward history were not useful for what I was struggling to do at the same so I had great ambivalence about psychoanalytic training I thought it was still the most interesting and thoughtful psychology we had available to us necessary for an approach to history on the other hand I thought that if taken uh, literally in its uh, more narrow dogma you were really 
uh, eliminating history in the name of studying it. Uh, and Erickson was an enormous uh, help to me because I, I could perceive that he had the same ambivalence and he had been working creatively with that ambivalence for 40 years, so, uh, or did, uh, uh, and I could see, uh, and in fact, Erickson, um, I could tell over the years of friendship with him, had little to do socially with classical psychoanalysts or they with him. The most derogatory term, incidentally, because I knew some of them they could make toward him was a sociologist. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, when he would write at, at the end of Young Man Luther and all of his books, there's a statement saying, I am a Freudian psychoanalyst. It was very important to him. Hmm. It was his, I mean, he had been a student in Vienna. He'd come there as a teacher and a, an artist. Uh, uh, as he said, they educated me. Uh, and uh, he had thrived with that education. Uh, and it was his identity which then became uh, that of a Freudian psychoanalyst. So he never became a, quotes, neo-Freudian. Uh, in the end, these designations don't mean too much. It has to do with the intellectual quality of the particular person. And I thought that his was exceptional. And what I would emphasize, he taught me that one could bring psychoanalysis into history. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be simply in the consulting room. Uh, and, and he did that with great elegance. And then your experience, just when you actually went, became an analytic candidate, I think was quite mixed. You have told me your actual analysis, you had quite a high opinion of th that experience, but the actual milieu of the Boston psychoanalytic had features that were more, di were more perturbing, let's put it that, like that. Boston psychoanalytic was one of the more orthodox institutes, and it, had, it was run by uh, talented emigres, uh, but the, just the intellectual discourse was not very broad. I was, I was analyzed by Bata Rank, uh, Otto, Otto Rank's first wife, and I was proud to learn later on that she had been Freud's uh, hostess. When people came from out of town, uh, he was then very close to both Otto and Beata, and he would ask her to help entertain them. His, his own wife, as you know, was too much of a, what, a homebody to take on this function in the Victorian, uh, in the Victorian household that the Freuds maintained. Um, in any case, uh, I was analyzed by her. Uh, I had some trepidation at that time because there, the, the analytic idea could be fairly tight and, um, and I was concerned lest my, my wild forays uh, into Japan where I did a research study even before Hiroshima and then uh, Hong Kong, where I studied thought reform, could be seen as aberrant or, quotes, acting out. <laughs> but, that, but that wasn't the case with Beata Rang. She was a sensitive and thoughtful analyst, and I think I gained a lot from that analysis. But the atmosphere in the Institute, uh, there were occasional teachers whom I admired and could have a kind of dialogue with, but the atmosphere was fairly narrow. So when I was given a chair at New Haven, uh, some years later, after I went back to the Far East, did some studies, came back, uh, and then there was the opportunity to uh, continue the psychoanalytic study uh, in the Southern New England Institute, which had a base in New Haven. I declined to do that. And then by that time, it wasn't important for me to become a psychoanalyst because I was doing this psychohistorical work, for better or worse. I think you put it more strongly in The Witness to an Extreme Century that you found actual sort of uh, affinities, not all of them, but your eight, your eight um, criteria, that there were some of them that sort of seemed to you to resonate with what you were discovering in this, in this world of psychoanalysis. Um, my way of coping with my psychoanalytic training and at the same time trying to write up my first book on Chinese thought reform, and as you know, writing up one's first book is a terrible ordeal, mm -hmm. because when you're writing your first book, you alternate between the feeling that this is the greatest thing ever written and nothing else will have to be said about it after that, and the sense that it's nothing but junk and it's worthless, <laughs> and why the hell did you embark on it in the first place? So I was going, going through all that uh, and, uh, and experiencing some of the narrowness of the Psychoanalytic Immediate Institute. 
Uh, and so, uh, but it wasn't only that. I also began to look at American um, American training and teaching projects and how they might have tendencies toward totalism or ideological totalism. That term, ideological totalism, the term totalism was originally Erickson's, and then I used ideological totalism in thinking about Chinese thought reform. Uh, and so I looked at training procedures, graduate programs. If in the procedure uh, one's merit and uh, uh, capacity to pass through it well depends upon having the right ideas, you want to look at tendencies toward totalism in that process. And with psychomotive training, as many of you in the audience know, I felt that structurally the combination of one's being a candidate, a student, and a patient under the same group of authorities lent itself toward a possibility of totalism. And actually, analysts had begun to write about this. I was by no means the first one to talk about these issues. Erickson had said a bit about it, and I had many conversations with him. So I wrote about, very gently, uh, these inclinations toward totalism uh, that could occur in psychotic training, as I was in the middle of that training. But, it, you know, it, it, insofar as it was remarked on, I think people took it in stride. Either they, didn't, either they ignored it and didn't want to believe any of it, or, or they felt enough confidence to go on with their own. Well, one of the things you took, um, I don't know if it was from the psychoanalytic experience or where, but it was the idea of the one-to-one -one interview as a kind of research tool. And in your work, well, in the work in the 50s, um, all the way through the work in Hiroshima that you did with survivors of the Hiroshima uh, uh, catastrophe, through the work with Vietnam vets and on, you used yes. it, and through to the Nazi doctors and Al Shinrikyo in the 1990s, which we'll perhaps come to later, but you used this method. So can you just say something about how you developed that method of work? It evolved from my own residency training in psychiatry in terms of being taught the uh, what was called a modified psychoanalytic interview. And that meant what it sounds like, in which one interviewed people seeking to understand motivations, hearing them out, uh, and, uh, and drawing upon psychoanalytic principles, uh, I realized, and, and this, uh, uh, as Daniel said, it, it, it's been a central method all through my work, all through these different studies, but when I was confronted with the first study in Hong Kong in some depth of thought reform, uh, I naturally went about it by using a further modification of this interview method more in a direction of dialogue, because in every interview, there's a good book by Harry Stack Sullivan, the neo-Freudian, about the interview method, and he makes very clear, very simple point. Both sides in the interview have to get something out of it. And I was getting a lot out of it in learning about thought reform. What were they getting out of it was the question. And I suppose both people are affected by it consciously and unconsciously was an assumption you had as well, that there's an impact on the interviewer as well of of working in this way. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, that idea wasn't alien to psychoanalysis. No. Uh, but, uh, it, I mean, the interviews were very intense. They were interesting. They were fascinating because um, there, there were, was the extremity of pressures, psychological pressures, and in the case of Westerners in prison, physical pressures and torture and, so, and false confessions as well. But... Uh, in terms of what I could offer the people I was interviewing, I, became, I came to realize it had to do with a certain kind of therapeutic element. I wasn't in any way their physician or, or their, their uh, therapist and, and didn't want to be, but they could feel and I could experience, and I think my medical training contributed to that, some sense that I was concerned with sympathetic to their struggles uh, to overcome their confusion, uh, and they could get that kind of benefit from this interchange. But I had, to, uh, I had to supplement that interview method with what I called a mosaic method, and that really meant intense reading um, in uh, cultural issues, because I worked in Hong Kong, in Chinese culture, then in Japan, in Japanese culture, in Germany, in German culture, and uh, uh, 
you can't really understand what happens in an interview unless you know quite a bit about that culture. And I wasn't looking for cultural distinctions as my main approach, but rather for how cultural, uh, cultural elements, cultural emphases take one to the universal. And that's what I try to do in each of these four main studies that Daniel mentioned. And as I did them, you know, when you get into research, as in, in clinical work, your own sense of your identity becomes very important. People will say, oh, weren't you brave to interview Nazi doctors or uh, chi uh, Chinese intellectuals in Hong Kong? Uh, it's, it's not courage. It's a sense one has of oneself as one proceeds, the kind of person one is or can be or what one might do. And, and that evolved as I, as I did this work. Uh, but the reading and the mosaic supplement to the interview, including um, recent historical writings, because it was always the historical issue that was very crucial. You could have Chinese cultural emphasis, for instance, on, uh, on moderation, as is very strong in Confucianism. And yet, um, in Chinese uh, thought reform, uh, the whole process could go quite mad in its intensity. Uh, and so the historical tendency could work against a cultural emphasis, and there's always a counter-emphasis within Chinese culture, perhaps Taoism and other forms, against the Confucianism or any such culture. But you've got to read and immerse yourself in all this so that your interview work is more disciplined. I guess in about five minutes or so we'll open it out, but I just a couple of two or three more things I wanted to just ask you about. One is, I think in a way you've told me that the work with the Vietnam soldiers, sort of the vet veterans of the Vietnam War was a bit different in the sense that you became politically more directly involved in, in, in the, that whole issue and that that affected the work that you were actually doing in those interviews. Uh, I, I was always trying to balance, however imperfectly, scholarship and activism, as I mentioned before. At the time of the Vietnam War, it was the angriest book I wrote. Uh, it was a very angry time for many of us. You know, I had traveled with my wife to Vietnam. Uh, uh, as we used to say, we were against the war before it started. It was such a ridiculous and ultimately evil war. I came to describe in it a primary dynamic of an atrocity producing situation where the combination of military policy and psychological experience can lead an ordinary person with no particular psychological tendencies in that direction toward atrocities. Uh, in any case, uh, there was that anger and there was a lot of social anger, but still it was uh, necessary for me to be rigorous in my interviews and in those group sessions. And I had a chance to combine my advocacy and my scholarship uh, by being invited by the president of the VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, the anti-war veterans, to work with them in groups here in New York, which I did for three years, and again, and, and called in friends uh, who were in the healing professions, and uh, it was a, a fascinating kind of experience um, in which uh, it, it influenced my later work and everybody's, I think, who was involved in it, because we got off our therapeutic high, uh, uh, high hat, so to speak, and it was a kind of egalitarian process. And when we did stupid things, which are quite possible for therapists too, you know, uh, we could be uh, confronted also as we were. Uh, but it was very moving and one could combine one's anti-war feelings with one's psychological work with them. And the groups always belonged to the veterans not to us, so we call them rap groups rather than therapy groups. Anyhow, I did those which were a very important part of my Vietnam study, along with interviewing uh, returning uh, veterans in terms of their experience. And I guess a line, I'm not going to follow it now, but would be sort of to think about politics and your interest also in the anti-nuclear issue, both nuclear weapons and nuclear power. But I, I wanted, given that this is psychoanalysis and the post-war period, but just in a way to revisit 
your link with your links in the 60s and 70s with a number of the people who've been mentioned and discussed at this conference and I don't know if you would like to just perhaps reminisce about a couple of them I know you met uh, Lang in England I know you met Alexander Michelich and some of the other people too but so perhaps you could just tell us about how you although you'd abandoned the analytic training but nonetheless you had these connections with that world and perhaps some of the people who oh, stood out for you I, I never ceased to have connections with the analytic mm -hmm. world at various sure, levels because <laughs> Ericsson was also <laughs> remained also a key figure a absolutely um, but what about with, Lang in Lang, uh, with Lang I, I just told uh, Daniel this incident I had with him in which I, I met him and uh, we had mutual friends and, and had some things in common. When I went to his office, which I think was on Harley Street or maybe around the corner from Harley Street, I'm not sure, uh, and we sat down, he offered me some tea, and there was complete silence. And it began to get awkward. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I should say something. And I thought, no, let the bastard say something. <laughs> so we sat there that way, and finally he said to me, it is difficult to get to one no to get to know one another, isn't it? 